Church. Ooh, good morning, Crossroads Church. Happy Sunday, and I want to also extend that welcome and good morning to our online community. Come on, let's tell them good morning. Good morning, online community. We are so glad to have you, no matter if you're watching it live or a replay. We are so glad to have you a part of our worship service this morning. If we have any first or second time visitors, welcome. We are so glad to have you. We're glad that you came, or we're glad that you came back. And... Um, this Sunday, we will be starting our second week of our um, praying, praying through service. This week, Pastor is talking about even Jesus had to pray sometimes. So I am definitely looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. Let's bow our heads this morning in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, good morning. We are so glad to be in your presence this morning, especially with our friends and family in your name. God, we love you and we are excited to give you the praise that you also deserve. Be with your people that are here, that are online, that are on the way to this physical building. God, touch them, be with them, fill them up wherever they are empty. God, we are here to worship you. We only have one agenda, and it is to give you the praise. So, God, accept our praise, and may it be a beautiful sound to your ears. In your son's holy, precious name, we say amen, amen, and amen. If you are able, stand on your feet. Let's get, get ready to worship this morning. God, you are so great. God, you are so good. Come on, if he's done anything for you this week, just start out this, this worship session with a thanksgiving on your mouth. If you have it in your spirit, just tell him thank you this morning. God, you are so holy. God, you are so worthy and we worship your holy name. God, your splendor is so beautiful to us. God, the splendor of the King. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light as darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our Put your hands on your chest and just say, my God is great. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let me tell you something about our God.
say name above all names you are worthy of all praise and my heart will see how great is our God come on name above all names say name Put a personal spin on it. to be praised hallelujah Jesus this next song that we're gonna sing for me personally is right on time <clears throat> in this world that we live in I don't even have to explain that there comes stresses and anxieties at every turn and the world seems very crazy in this season but one thing that I know for sure is that God is able and the first I'm about to pull a pastor. There's somebody said, uh, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. You have to start there. So we're going to ask God for change from within, not just in the world, but it starts with you. It starts with that personal change. God, change the ways within me so that I walk and look like you in this crazy world. If that's something that you, that you want to ask of him today, I welcome you to sing this song with me. Thank you, Jesus. Change me, oh God. Make me more like you. Change me, oh God. Wash me through. Oh, 
worship you Lord I need you to change me Change me, oh God, I'm asking you to change me. Turn the ugly things more like you, oh, change me. I'm never too old to learn from the Lord, oh, change me. Oh God, I'm not perfect, but you are, Lord, so change me to give my life to you. me oh we need you need you need you lord change me come on and help me say change change oh, change oh god change oh change Change me. I want to look like you, God. I want to look like you. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I want to be like you. Oh, change me, Lord. Say change. change. Oh, change. time.
thank you, Lord. Oh, God, change me from the inside out. Hey, oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you in advance for the change. God, we thank you for this human experience that we are so blessed with. We yield our lives to you, God, at the altar. We yield our hearts, our minds, our people, our things. God, it is all yours. We lay it at your throne. God, thank you for this series, Praying Through, because if anybody knows anything about prayer, it's you, Lord. God, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to speak with you. Teach us how to commune so that we can walk every day in your footsteps, God. You have shown us and we are willing to learn. We reach out and thank you to you today, Father. We love you. We praise you. We honor your sweet name. Together as a family, we say amen. Amen. And amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Just tell him thank you one more time. Just take a few extra moments just to tell him thank you this morning. God, we love you. presence of God. Oh man, it is good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. My old grandmama used to say he didn't have to do it. Oh my gosh, you better get in here early this morning. He did not have to wake us up, but he did. He did not have to make us uh, retain our right mind, but he did. He did not have to make sure that the house wasn't set on fire, but he and so when I say give the Lord some praise, why don't you? Come on now. Yes, sir. Last week, we were dealing with this whole issue of prayer and talked about praying through. And so today we're going to talk about Jesus and prayer. Stand on your feet. I want to show you something. The Word of God, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, says this. In the days of his humanity. Now, this is good. Now, watch this. In the days of his Christ, humanity, he offered up both prayers and pleas. What did he offer up? Prayers and what? And pleas. With loud crying and tears. I'm talking about Jesus. To the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his devout behavior. Although he was a son. He learned obedience. From the things which he suffered. I want to speak during our time this morning from the subject. Even Jesus had to pray sometimes. Oh, come on, y'all better get in here and repeat after me. Even Jesus had to do what? Sometimes you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now listen to me carefully. If Jesus had to pray, you know you and I need to pray. Come on, somebody. I don't know. Some of you should be praying now. I wish I had a witness in the house. That the Lord would allow me to block out all that I brought with me. Who am I talking to? so that I can sit quietly and receive the word of God. We should be praying now that whatever Lord, whatever was important, whatever was important for Jesus to pray about got to be important for me to pray about. So let's do this. Jesus understood what I want to call the power of isolated intimacy. That's what prayer is. Prayer, prayer is isolated intimacy. Come on, somebody. 
True intimacy can't be held in a crowd. It has to be isolated. See, sometimes you got to get by yourself. Come on. You got to tell people around you, I'll be back. (laughs) Because you need to be isolated. And Jesus understood this. Look at this. Jesus practiced prayer. How do I know this? The Bible says he prayed with others. He prayed alone. He prayed short prayers. Amen. There is a there is such a thing as a short prayer. He prayed a long prayer. He also, the Lord did, practice the posture of prayer. Scripture tells us, particularly in John 17, that he lifted up his eyes to pray. Come on, I don't know when you had to lift up your eyes and say, Lord Jesus, come on. So, I, Father God, <laughs> he knelt on his knees to pray in Luke 22, and he prayed falling on his face in Matthew 26. So Jesus understood the practice of prayer, and Jesus understood the posture of prayer, but I want to talk about what made him pray, what drove him to prayer, what what, what compelled him to pray. Mm. Today I want to show you five examples, and I'm going to do my best to show you five examples of the kinds of situations that drove Jesus, that moved Jesus, that made Jesus, that compelled Jesus to pray. If you're ready, say amen. Amen. Take your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. If you would, please, ma'am, please, sir. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 1. We're looking at this morning the truth that even Jesus had to pray sometimes. And we're going to look at this morning, what were those situations? What were those life-changing situations? What were those moments in time where Jesus says, hold on, wait a minute, let me put some prayer in it. Even he did this. Look at this. Number one, when we talk about what compelled Jesus to pray, there's so many of them, but I brought five. The first thing that compelled Jesus to pray, I want to say this to you, was desirable temptation. Now, let me, you better, mm, see, I thought, somebody said, Pastor, I thought all temptation was desirable. Mm, No. See, I have this thing, I hate coconuts. Did I say hate? That wasn't a euphemism. Absolutely hate coconut. So if you bring me a coconut pie, coconut cake, and say, Pastor, I know your blood sugar up. I brought you a coconut cake to push you over the edge. Y'all, did y'all catch that? Amen. It wouldn't be a temptation for me because I, I, what? I hate coconut. So although you think it's a temptation, it's not because I don't, but if you brought me a homemade pound cake and a little bit of bluebell, come on somebody, then we have a situation. So not all temptation will drive you to prayer, but some temptation is, see, the enemy knows what you like. And he also knows what you want. Watch this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after he had fasted 40 days, and 40 nights. Now, so he was led up by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. And then G- and the devil knew he's this man been up here 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. He became hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, watch this, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. See, the devil's plan was real simple in this text. Through temptation, his goal was, and the same thing is true to us, his goal was to get Jesus to forsake the Father's lordship over his life. This is important. Temptation is designed to, for you to, dis, to, to, to design so that you will no longer give, make God Lord over your life. Everybody wants to be saved and escape hell, but God says that's only part of the equation. I need to be Lord of your life while you're still breathing. And temptation is designed so that you won't no longer give that lordship to the God, to Jesus. You, you decide my appetite is my new God. This is good. 
He tempted Christ to deny the Father's provision. He said, listen, I know you're hungry. Make your own bread. You, anybody know what I'm talking about? I know you're hungry. Don't, do what I, don't wait on my plans to feed yourself. Make your own bread. He said he tempted Jesus to deny the Father's promotion. He says, listen, I'm going to show you all the cities of the world. Now, Jesus is going to rule the entire world, but, but some of us have rulership in our situation, but in our timeline, but we can't wait. We want to rule now. Some of you have a promotion waiting on you, but you're doing stuff to hurry it up. Come on, I'm going to tell you, rather than hurry it up, you're probably going to mess it up. Temptation, he also, he, the Father tempted him to deny, the devil tempted him to deny the Father's protection. He says, listen, cast yourself down on these stones. Now, I know you're all powerful. You're going to just, before you hit the ground, the angels are going to come and swoop you up. Some of us are prepared to end our lives because we have forgotten that God is still the Lord of our lives. But the most haunting thing to me was this revelation that you see in Luke chapter 14, chapter 4, verse 13. I want to show it to you, the New Living Translation. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Watch this. Until what? The next opportunity. See, he may leave, but he's not going to stay gone. Celebrate that he's gone, but lock the back door. Come on, somebody. Oh, that's all right. Y'all get that one on your way home. If you, if you mess around and get him out, lock him out. Oh, that's good. See, you can't keep hanging with the same folk you've been hanging with. Oh, Lord. And think you're going to lock him out. Mm -mm. You can't keep going. My God, <laughs> where you love to go if you're going to lock him out? You got to change some things. I wish I had a witness in the house. When Jesus prayed, watch this, Jesus prayed in advance to manage the challenge of temptation because he understood the persistent pull on the life of the folks who love the Lord. There's going to be a persistent pull. Say that with me, persistent pull. See, you got to understand that this is not just a one-off. Temptation has never been a one-off. You're in Matthew, right? Go to Matthew 26, verse 40. See, desirable temptations require you to stop, drop, and roll right away like you're on fire. <laughs> so I, I was going to explain that, but I better not. Amen. <laughs> See, I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting better. Amen. There are situations in my life where I stop, come on, drop, tuck the moms in. You better pray right away. I told y'all what Hammer said last week. You got to pray just to make it. Today, <laughs> I, I, how do you quote MC? I don't know. Keep praying. Did I tell you Matthew 26? Watch this. Verse 40. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, could you men, you men could not spend watch with me for one hour. And then he said something here in verse 41. Keep watching and keep praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing. That flesh is weak. I get it. You make up your mind as a believer that I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to stay in my lane. And you make up your mind. And the flesh said, we didn't agree to that. That's between you and your mind and God. But me, as for me and my flesh, we with the devil. Amen. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, y'all act like y'all have never been tempted to go back to what you came out of. They were asleep. Jesus says, couldn't you wait with me? One hour. See, temptation, we learn from this, like I said earlier, is not a one-off. And temptation only occurs when you're weak. And this is going to surprise you. You know when you're at your weakest point? It's right after a victory. Because mm, you're high on the victory. And your guard goes. And so then... During times of weakness, I brought some examples. It's during times of weakness that we tend to use pornography. It's during times of weakness that we drink to excess. It's during times of weakness that we decide to skip our workout. 
quiet up in here. Yes, it is. It's during times of weakness that we decide to gossip against our boss and our co-workers. It's during times of weakness when we surf Facebook while we're supposed to be working at work. Mm, let me know. When I, if you can't say ouch, just say amen. It's during times of weakness when we give in to anger and say something that we know is going to be hurtful. This is the one we use for the people we love. Because we know what hurts them, so we say things in anger because we're weak and we're tempted. You know, I've been wanting to get you told this is a good time. Amen. Don't do it. This last one is interesting because I, I decided not, I decided to put it on there, even though it's one of my favorites. Amen. Temptations to overspend or engage in emotional shopping, bro. I will buy something when I don't feel good in a heartbeat. Come on, my brothers and sisters. Anybody? I got any one or two. Amen. I shot, bruh. And when they did the internet, it was a wrap. I thought I was going to have to about to lose my mind. You mean I can click and they can bring it to the house? <laughs> but if you're broke, that's a temptation. Come on. So, amen. It's not a sale if you ain't got no money. That's all right. I just... Jesus does something in the text. He, he wants us to expect temptation, and then he provides us the best defense. Here's your defense, amen, for praying for, through those desirable temptations. I got to hustle here. He says, here's what you do when you, when you're, when, to, to, to get ready for a temptation that you know you want to do. He says, one thing, keep watching. Secondly, keep praying. When he says keep watching here, this means be mindful that there's a threat. Be mindful that there is a threat. It, this is a conscious awareness that there is an actual and imminent threat in your spiritual life. Something is trying to get you. I'm not saying walk around paranoid, but you got to be on point. Keep watching because you know at any moment the enemy is going to try to trip you up. You, gotta, you can't be asleep on this. He also says, I need you to keep watching. He, literally, this means to avoid, avoid intoxication. Now, it has nothing, ironically, to do with alcohol. When he talks about being uh, watchful, it means to avoid intoxication. It's not just alcohol. He says, I need you to be careful uh, about becoming intoxicated by those things that excite you. Like pound cake. I have no business walking into a bakery, amen, the blood sugar, 350, and I'm going to buy a cake. What are we doing? That's a, that's a terrible example, but if you understand what I'm saying, say Amen. See, you have to be mindful, he says, that there, you got the stuff that excites you. You have to be careful. This might be a temptation. Then he also said, keep praying. He says, prayer will actually help you to fight off drowsiness. So we see first out the gate this morning that Jesus prayed when temptation was desirable. The enemy said to Jesus, make bread because Jesus was hungry. He said to the Jesus, um, you could have these cities under my control because Jesus came to Christ, came to earth to be the authority, uh, amen. And so he wanted, the devil wanted him to skip the process. He also said, listen, your father can't take care of you, take care of yourself. Number two, what was it that compelled Jesus to pray? Not only did desirable temptation compel Jesus to pray, but also non-stop trouble compelled Jesus to pray. Is anybody on that train? Non-stop trouble. Some of y'all on the other train, trouble, you have peace. Trouble, you have peace. Some of us on the train, next stop, trouble. Next stop, trouble. You're like, dog, does this train go anywhere else? Jesus, his disciples didn't understand the correlation between trouble and victory. I want, you're, in, you're in Matthew, right? Go to John. Take your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Jesus' disciples didn't understand the correlation, maybe like we don't, but there's a correlation between trouble and victory. Hmm. John, chapter 12, verse 24 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Now stay with me. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
So then Jesus says, in order for something to live, something has to die. Stay with me. Verse 25. The one who loves his life must lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So let's, let's unpack this. Jesus says to them, you, you've seen me triumph, you've seen me enter Jerusalem, you, and you thought that my kingdom would be set up without any missed opportunities, without any misfortune, without any trouble. He said, all you've seen is the victory in my life. So you thought things were going to be easy from now on. He says, no way, Jose. He says, I will have to die. I will have to endure trouble. And, and if you will truly serve me, you're going to have to follow me, even though there are going to be moments of calamity in your life. You must be willing to endure trials. You must be willing to endure trouble. You must be willing to endure difficulty sometimes because you're looking toward the future. So get this in your head this morning. Sometimes God has to take something from you so he can replace it with something better. What we always count as loss is sometimes victory. See, because sometimes God will say, Pastor, I need you to move. And I'm like, nope, this is cozy and this is comfortable. So I'm not going to move. He says, okay, then I'm going to move the blind. I'm going to pull, come on, somebody, the comfort out from underneath you. And guess what happens when he does that? I'm moving. Sometimes God will do that. And I'm not saying he's punitive. I'm saying he's doing what he has to do to take you to where you need to be. And he's already determined where that is. So... What then does he do, Jesus, with this admission of trouble? He says, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to go through something. You think it's going to be easy, but it's not. The one he came to that revelation, here's what he did. He prayed. Drop down to verse 27 of John chapter 12. Now, my soul has become, there's our word, troubled. Now, this is a reference to emotional distress and mental turbulence. So when you are troubled, your mind is feeling some kind. Anybody been through? I don't know anybody yet. That they call it foggy brain now. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Sometimes your emotions get so, get so discombobulated that your mind gets, gets a little foggy. And tr I, don't know, I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. I can't tell. He says, my soul has become troubled. And what am I to say? Father... Save me from this hour, but for this purpose. He says, I, I, every time he says, I could pray, Lord, get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out. He says, no, I'm not going to keep praying that. But for this purpose, I came for this hour. See, we pray for exit doors as a default. Jesus prayed for something else. Verse 28, here's what he prayed for. In the middle of trouble, he said, Father, glorify your name. See that? He didn't say, get me out. He said, whatever this is, you get some glory out of it. People pay close attention to you when you're in trouble. You notice that? Amen. Let something break. Everybody know about it. You know they're going through something right now. And that's good that they know you're going through something right now because they're also going to have a front row seat to God's victory over that thing. Jesus said, I don't want you to get me out of this. I want you to get glory out of this. That's, rev that's revolutionary to me. Get glory out of this. Not get me out all the time, but get glory. While people are watching, get glory. While things look like they can't be fixed, get glory. While folks have abandoned me, get glory out of this. Watch this. Then a voice came from heaven, verse 28. I have both glorified and I will glorify it again. God said, I'm working. <laughs> Bruh. I did it. I, I owe Tatra Bet royalties because God said if I did it before, that's good news. Come on, somebody. I don't know who needs that this morning. Come on, give the Lord some praise in this house this morning. Come on now. Nonstop trouble means you're getting set up for victory. 
Like Jesus, we must pray through trouble, praying that somehow the Father's going to use this round of trouble to give himself glory in our lives. The third situation that drove Jesus to prayer was this. And this is good for me. You, this, is, this is right. This, you should get this. It was important decisions that drove or compelled Jesus to pray. Important decisions. In the life we're living in right now, I want to say every decision is an important decision. People make choices that they can't come back from in this culture. Look at this. I want you to take your Bible to Luke chapter 6. See, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Yes. Amen. Decisions, especially life-altering decisions, should never be rushed. If somebody is quickly pressuring you to make, if somebody's pressuring you to make a quick decision, particularly a life-altering decision, a rash decision, in my opinion, your answer should always be no. Early in our lives, when we were first married, we went to this sales pitch where you can buy dish towels and forks and vacuum cleaners at an exorbitantly high price. Amen. But they package it up. You can buy it. We can fill up your whole house for $19.95. We still have grand, great grandchildren. We've still been paying that $19.95 trying to pay off the vacuum cleaner that broke a long time ago. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And we were sitting on the edge of our seats thinking for $19.95, we can fill up the house right now. And I never forget it. It was an old lady sat behind us. She didn't say nothing to us the whole day. And she leaned for us. She said, Don't sign that. <laughs> Y'all think I make this stuff up? I don't. She said, baby, don't sign that. We're going to get our free coffee pot. We're going to get out of here. <laughs> and they want you to sign when? Yeah. Right now. And get mad at you. I remember the last time I blew up the timeshare office. They called managers. I like, it's still no. Y'all can go get Obama. I'm still I ain't signing for him either. I ain't buying no timeshare. Give me my tickets for the rest of my vacation. Let me look. <laughs> Life-altering decisions, <laughs> if there's somebody pressuring you, I don't care what it is, somebody's pressuring you, you ought to say, mm, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Now, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. Now, Mark 6, 46 tells us that Jesus would often retreat to places like the mountains where he could hold communion with God uninterrupted. Drop verse 12 again. And he spent the whole night in prayer with God, and when the day came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Now, there is, there was, this was an occasion of genuine, genuine importance to me. Um, the men that Jesus was going to choose this night would bear the responsibility of taking the gospel to the entire world. So instead of just saying, I'm choosing him because he's handsome, I'm choosing him because he's smart, I'm choosing him because he's politically connected, I'm choosing him because he's got money, Jesus went and said, God, who do you want me to choose regardless if he has nothing? Who is it that's going to take this message to these people? We've said this, you've heard it before, we look on the outside, God looks at the heart. And so sometimes before you got to make these important decisions, you need to pray. You kidding me? Some questions Christ needed to pray. Some will say, well, why, if he's divine, why did he have to pray at all? Didn't he already know all things? But you got to remember that Jesus was both God and man at the same time. And his need to pray was just as valid as his need after the 40-day fast to eat was. Because he was 100% God, 100% man. Just so you know, this is what makes Christianity unique. God came down from his throne and embedded himself in the womb that he created and allowed himself to be birthed out of a woman that he made so that when he said, I got you, he would know what he was getting about you. Do you get this? He walked on the dirt you're walking on. He breathed the air you're breathing on. He was pressed by the stuff you're pressed with. So when he said, I've, I'm tempted beyond measure, but I'm not going to sin because somebody needs to be able to go through this mess and not sin so God can get the glory. 
That is your hook. You can't walk in the fullness of God and the completion of the Lord in terms of being sinless. So Jesus said, I'm going to pull it off. And if you believe in me, then technically you pulled it off. I wish I had a witness in this house. Anybody need that help? Can I have an amen in the house? You got to be under, you, we need to understand something. Important decisions require you to pray. Stop deciding on the spur of the moment. Stop Googling everything. Go, go, I tell you, stop Googling, start Godding. Is that a word, Godding? Googling, Godding? I ain't hating on Google. Google been very, very good to me. Amen. But there are some questions Google can't answer. I wish, it. neither can Alexa. Who else is out there? Siri, come on, somebody. See, Christ was a mediator between God and man, right? So it was proper for him to seek divine direction and blessing. As the mediator between God and man, he said, Lord, Father God, what do you want me to do? I, and then he would look at the people and get some insight. Okay, this is what we're going through. So he was, the, he was the mediator, so he had to pray. He set us an example to follow. This is important. In times of great emergencies and when you're about to encounter special difficulties and you got somebody putting new responsibility on you at work or at home, you should pray. I wish I had a witness here. Staying as long as needed. What? You stay as long as needed to be heard by God and keep staying down there so that you can hear God. This is not a situation. Some decisions are so strong so impactful that you can't say the, the wonderful prayer that we love to pray, amen, Jesus will, amen. No. Some prayers are going to require you to pray for days. Some decisions require you to spend a month looking to hear God's voice. You better get in here. I told you this in our financial series. If you're going to spray, if you're going to spend a hundred dollars, you pray for an hour before you spend it. Don't buy it right away. Walk around the store some more, Amen. And you'll be amazed. The Holy Spirit said, we don't need that. You know what? We don't need this. But when you start talking about praying, spending $10,000, you need to stay on your, come on, you need to pray for a month before you sign that. See, prayer is what we need as a, as a divining rod, if I could use that. Some of y'all don't know what that is, to find God's will. I know what I want, but I need to know what you want. And praise God, sometimes they line up. Sometimes what he wants is what I want. But sometimes when he says, no, don't do that, then I got to do like my, like my children when I say, no, you can't have a car. I don't know why these folk don't treat me like they, who they think they are. I got right to the car like everybody else do. Mope your little cell phone along. Jesus can handle it. Amen. Some of y'all act like y'all scared. He's not disappointed. He laughs. God is big enough and heavy enough to handle your disappointment. We, Father God, we come. Now, I'm saying sometimes, look, Lord, I'm tired of waiting. Amen. Y'all see y'all act like y'all. And he said, I don't care how tired you are. Amen. I said, I ain't trying to be disrespectful or nothing, but I'm, can you move? He said, when I get ready. And I say, okay, then. I don't know why God don't move when I tell him. See, this is why, you, did, did you notice that Jesus says, I call him Abba, Father. You know what that means? This is not a clinical relationship. This is a relationship of somebody who's intimate. Come on, somebody. So I ask intimate questions for intimate situations to gain intimate solutions. Amen. And you got to be willing to stop deciding so quickly. Everything is instant. Grits are instant. Come on, somebody. Banking is instant. Dating. What is it called? Speed dating. Uh-uh. So you want me to devote the rest of my life to you and you just told me, hi, I'm, I'm Jill and I like painting and plants. Yeah, whatever. I'm not committing to you because of that. We're going to have to talk a little longer than that, sister. I can't. Because you got on a cute blouse, it's going to take a little more than that. My gosh. Look at this. Jesus said sometimes the weight of anxiety See, what we do with anxiety is we keep piling it on. This is good for me. I'm going I'm, I'm I'm to confess. I am a professional worrier at times. And so what I do with my worry is I worry about what I worried about. Then I ask, come on, anybody, and I put some more worry on top of that worry, and I take all that worry with me, amen, to my new worry. 
That's what I do. I, amen. I've been saved a long time, but I like to control things. And because I want to be in control of things, I worry when I can't. Let me show you what Jesus suggested. Verse 29, we're still in Matthew 26, verse 39, verse 39. Watch this. He said in verse 38 that his soul was grieved. Did I give you that? Mm, I did not. Go back to verse 38. Now, actually, go back to verse 36. Watch this. I'm sorry, I got caught up in my own, in my own teaching. I told you that important decisions made Jesus pray, pray and, 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 and I, I kind of started teaching it before I gave you what we were talking about. Heavy burdens drove Jesus to pray, pray as well. Heavy burdens. See, sometimes we forget that as much as Jesus was divine, he was also human. A true man, he had true feelings and he had true sensibilities because he was a man. Now take your Bible to Matthew 30, 26. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 36. Important decisions should cause you to pray, right? Nonstop trouble should cause you to pray. Desirable temptation should cause you to pray. But heavy burdens usually drive you to pray. <laughs> if you hadn't prayed before, let some heavy hit your, hit your family, hit your heart. You, you just pray anyway. Amen. Some of y'all have learned your best prayers when things weren't going well. God said, I ain't heard from you in three months. You got that flat tire, you start praying automatically, Lord Jesus. I'm on the side of the road, and I know I hadn't put any air in my spare like I'm supposed to, and I'm out here. Watch this in Matthew 26, verse 36. Then, then when Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to be grieved and distressed. So... We get Jesus in a heavy burden. He says, in the text that he began to be grieved and distressed. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Many of you know why he went there. And he was grieved and distressed. So he took his three main boys with him. And he said, surely, in a moment like this, the three people I count on the most in my life, Tiffany, surely they're going to pray with me and cover me. Anybody, anybody know where I'm going? Say Amen. Certainly not unusual for the Lord to slip away and pray alone, but this time he brought his three closest disciples. You know why? Because his human heart craved sympathy. Don't miss this. When somebody asks you and there's tears in their, their voice is shaking, there's tears in their heart, they're rumbly a little bit in there. You can tell they're shaky. When they ask you to pray, you know what they're craving? They're craving your sympathy. How many times we've ruined people by somebody says, listen, brother, can you pray with me? I'm going through some and I'm, I'm having, you know, I got a doctor's report. And I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and, um, and, 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 and try to get, make this appointment, but I'm not comfortable about what's going to happen. You ain't got no faith. If you, wait a minute. How about, how about not blasting them? Amen. How about saying, you know what? Here's two words that always work. Let's pray. It's a magic elixir. You call me in tears. I don't try to figure out, well, 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 why did he do that? Well, why did she say that? It doesn't matter. Here's what you should say. What? Come on, let's pray. And you don't need to know what to pray. You bow down because the Spirit is going to say, good, now let me have it from here. And then he won't be Father God. You'll be like, Lord, this man has a doctor's report, and we don't know what it says, but you do. And no matter what it says, you're still in control. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus said to these guys, pray with me, because he craves sympathy. Verse 38, Matthew 26. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watching me. Now notice that he doesn't hide from his men, the extreme weight of his heart. I'm going I'm to tell you something. You need to surround yourself around people. People, You need to surround yourself with people who are okay when you're not okay. I remember so many times, some very strong saints, I, I'm thinking of one in my in my heart right now, she was there for everybody. She was a rock of Gibraltar. And then, then she went down and folks scattered. 
See, see folks that were only, only with her because she was holding them up. Every now and again, I need friends who are going to be able to. See, this is why I don't have a crowd of people in my life. You, I do not. There's one or two that I call because when I call them, Dante, I know they're going to say there's two magic words. Let's pray. Look at this. He didn't hide his extreme heart, heaviness of his heart, right? It wasn't simply a, a threat of physical pain, but it, it wasn't so much the threat of the physical pain that he was praying about when he was grieved about. It was the extensiveness. We know that the pain was extensive and excessive, but that wasn't what he was really praying about. Truth, the truth of the matter is his heaviness was due to the fact that he was incarnate God, the God man. And he was submitting himself to the punishment of sin, tasting death for every one of us, bearing in his own person the inexpressible bitterness and the punitive humiliation of your sin and my sin. What grieved him was that he had to give an account for sins that he had not even committed himself. And not just Dwight's sin and Wallace's sins, but the sins of the whole. Can you imagine that? He's facing punishment and he has to deal with God's wrath to give an account for every sin ever committed by everybody. Yes, he was heavy. And how did he handle this heaviness? The same way he handled tr the trouble. He prayed. Verse 39. And he went a little further beyond them and he fell on his face and prayed. You've heard me tell you this. I say it again, you some every now and again, you need to get off your feet, go past your knees, come on somebody, and get on your face. I don't know if anybody, anybody ever, anybody, anybody in the house ever, ever come on? I, I, I can remember the moment, I remember the last moment that I was inhaling carpet fibers crying. Come on somebody. You know what that says to God? I'm, I'm as flat as I can be. I, I bring no, I bring no, I bring nothing with me, God. If you don't get me up from here, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to come on somebody to get up. Jesus prayed this kind of prayer because the heaviness of sin. When heaviness comes upon your life, get down on, come on somebody. Get down on past your knees, past your feet, and stretch out your arms and just pray. And sometimes when I'm so heavy, I don't even know that I pray, Miss Tiffany. Sometimes I just cry. Come on, somebody, say amen. There's some times in your life where you just need to have a good, old-fashioned, snot feel. Come on, somebody. You're not trying to be cute. You're not trying to be, come on, holy, amen. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this, Lord. I remember when I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. And it didn't, as things tend to, my family will tell you, nothing phases me immediately. I'm your guy in the moment. You need somebody strong in a minute, but three weeks later, puddle. And I said to God, so many things, what's going on? But my biggest question is, why are you doing this to, come to me? I wish I had a witness in the house. And then after saying that, it was just crying. Oh, I, I, I mm. Verse 39, he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, and oh, by the record, by the way, God healed me. I'm four years clean. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Working on five right now. I wish I had a witness. Sometimes you got to act, quit acting like you understand why you're going through what you're going through. Quit pretending like you know. You don't know. And tell God, I don't. Come on, let me help you practice. Say, God, I don't know. Come on, somebody say it again. You need to go into the Lord in prayer in heavy moments. Jesus did. If Jesus felt heavy and he prayed, what's wrong with us? I got this. And this is when I say to you, bless your heart. Because not only are you going to fall down and be broken into pieces, you're going to be falling down and broken into little pieces. I am quick to tell God when I'm in over my head, you better get in, somebody. 
Can I submit to me? Some of y'all have made me pray on my face. Look at God. Amen. <laughs> People call a pastor at the midnight hour saying, oh, uh, pastor, this just fell apart. And I'm like, oh, praise God. I get off the phone like, Lord Jesus. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? And I love it what he tells me. Nothing. Give it to me. Be there when they answer. And as soon as you hang up, Boy, y'all don't know how fast I take y'all to the Lord. I only, it's, like a, it's like a hot potato. Poo, poo, there they go, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all like to hold on the heaviness. Oh, Lord, I'm just, what's wrong with you? I'm heavier. Not me. I'm like, foom, foom. Amen. <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and tired. Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Come on, pastor. Saying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup do what? Pass from me. And then he says something real huge, man. He says, yet, not as I will, but as you will. He says, listen, and now, hear me well. Pray for a breakthrough. Pray for release. Pray for understanding. Pray for freedom. Pray for healing. I'm, I, and, and, and then say, well, Lord, whatever you want, though, that's what I want. But this is what I want. Just, just in case you didn't know what I wanted, <laughs> this is what I need. But if you're not ready to give that to me, then give me what you want me to have. You know how strong that is. Come on, you know what God says to you? I can work with that. Do you know he's got you anyway, whether you ate? I'm not worried about it. Right, watch this. He says, let this pass. But if you can't, I submit to your plan. Our last situation that, that drove Jesus, that compelled Jesus to pray was this. I know we've been kind of on the negative side all day today, but I want you to see something else. You know what else made Jesus pray? Heartfelt joy made Jesus pray. When he got happy, he prayed. Take your Bible to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to show it to you. Verse 17. Come on, somebody. I, I, I have had, man, I remember a few moments where I had a praise party. I told you when I got my when when the doctor told me that first year he didn't see nothing, it was a praise party. Amen. Up in that little, come on, somebody. I hope they had cameras because they got a full view. Amen. Of the praise party. <laughs> I was so happy. I was just praying out loud, praying. Amen. I mean, just anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes when the joy of the Lord gets on you, your spirit of God move, you can't do nothing but go on shout and dance. If you hadn't been there, you ought to ask God, release me so that I can shout with the joy of the Lord in my heart. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. Whenever I get a breakthrough, I start praying out loud. Thank you. And here, if you can't say nothing else, three words. Thank you, Lord. My second verse. Thank you, Lord. My chorus. Thank you, Lord. My vamp. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you with me? Say amen. amen. Jesus sent out 36 pairs. I'm going to give you a little context of individuals to minister. Did I tell you, take your Bible to Luke 10, 17. He sent out 36 groups of people to minister. This was in a season now when first the opposition against Jesus was growing. Remember, his disciples thought it was going to be easy, but folks didn't want Jesus to be the Messiah. The religious folks didn't want him to be the leader, they, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the politicians wanted him to be a ruler, and Jesus was facing opposition. And it was growing. His cousin, John the Baptist, was preaching the gospel. They locked him up. This is when Jesus sent them out. Cities, the cities in which he performed miracles in, live miracles, they were still unrepentant. There were cities like Samaria that said, you can't come back to this city anymore, Mr. Jesus. We don't need your traveling sideshow. Stay out of our city. So this is the environment in which he sent out these 36 tag teams of ministers. Verse 17, Luke chapter 10. Now the 72, look at this, in, in spite of all their opposition, returned with something called joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The text says that they return with joy. For the record, joy ought to be a characteristic of your salvation. Amen. Just for the record. 
Watch this. What did Jesus do when his heart was filled with joy? He did the same thing that he did when his heart was filled with, when he had to face trouble, when he was heavy, when he got joyful, he prayed. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him to pray. See, joyful prayer reflects the connection and the empowerment that Jesus had through the Holy Ghost. The joyful prayer, come on, watch this, shows an appreciation for the work of God the Father. Joyful prayer right here shows that he was, he was happy that his followers had had success. When joy wells up in your heart, you ought to lift up your hands. You ought to move your feet if you can. And if you can't get up quickly, get up slowly. I wish I had a witness. And if you can't raise one hand, both hands, raise but you ought to be able to say to the Lord, thank you for this. I have had a praise party. Come on, somebody at the mailbox. When you look and you open up, they said, this looks like a check. <laughs> Who am I talking to? It's like, because you, you, come on, we all recognize Bill. Say amen. So, Because I'm thumbing through. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating. The Lord going to bless me again, Bill, Bill, Bill. This looks like a check. And I'm not dignified. I don't go into the house. I start at the mailbox. <laughs> because I want my neighbors to see me shout. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. Prayer and praise ought to be a spontaneous and natural reaction to the circumstances of your life, whatever they are. Mm. When I got the diagnosis, I wasn't happy, but I had joy. I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. I'm not sure when you're going to do it, but I know this in my heart. You're going to do it. Now, you, like Christ, can express joy through prayer even when your circumstances don't seem to, to go along with that. See, prayer is the way to find joy, though, in the middle of it. And prayer is the way to find joy, whatever it is. In the middle of it and whatever it is, I start praying now. It's like, Lord... I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we're doing. You hear my heart. So prayer should be not just something you do when it's time to eat. Prayer should be, you should be praying throughout the whole day in your whole life. Amen. The other day, I made it home from Bible study. I teach our Bible study in the lobby. And for some reason, when I got in my driveway, the Holy Ghost said, Pray. And I went in. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to make it home. I don't know. I don't know what. He knows what I should. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. He knows what I avoided on my ride home that I have no idea what I avoided. He said, this, this, I don't know. I can't tell you everything, but you better pray. And I sat in my driveway and I thanked them for making it home. I thanked them for Brother Terry filming. I thanked them for the 80 or so people that listened to it on Wednesday. I thanked them for my driveway. I thanked them for my... My hedges, I ain't know, I want to cover everything. I thank them for the hedges in the front of my house. I said, thank you, Lord. I, don't, I thank them for my wife. I thank them for my son-in-law and my daughter. Amen. I just said, Lord, I don't know what this is. I thank you so very much that, my, that Sister Boone already cooked. I'm going to eat when I get in the house. Somebody say amen. We don't, we don't pray enough, in my opinion. Until we need something. I'm done. I got to stop here. I'm, I'm, I, I. See, the world has an idea of happiness and joy. Remember, there was a joy of the Lord that taught Jesus. Uh, there was a joy of the Holy Spirit led Jesus to pray. The world has a different idea of what joy is. Aristotle, very incredible Greek philosopher, boiled it down. He says, men can only have joy four ways in their lives. And I, just, I think this is worth showing you. He says... There is a certain kind of joy he calls it latest. And it's the immediate rush you get when you accumulate something material. When you buy that first, that new pair of shoes, or you click on the link and purchase something. When you get that new house or whatever it is, when you go to the store and get that bag of potato chips and you crack it open. He says that's the kind of joy that should last you a long time. Do you know material joy doesn't last you a long time? Then he says there is Felix, which is this is the joy that you get when you measure yourself, when you measure people. You measure other people by yourself. And when you determine that there ain't no better bass players, I listened to my boy, he told me he was tight. I listened to him, he ain't better than me. And then your spirit wells up with joy. That's not the kind of joy we're talking about, buying material things or thinking I'm better than somebody. He's the, there is this, this other kind of joy when, when you decide I'm going to do something nice for others. You know what's, what's wrong with doing something nice for others? Most of the time we brag about it. 
So were you really doing it for them or were you really doing it for you? Then he also says this is joy. He calls it a sublime beato joy. And this is the search of significance. People write a song. They'll, they'll visit an art of gallery. They'll, they'll, they'll watch birds and they get joy, religion. He says, this is joy. This is not the joy you, should, you and I should be looking at. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says it this way. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine. I'm going someplace. And send portions to anyone who has nothing already. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. Watch this. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. A bit of context here. The men of God read the word of God to the people of God. And the people broke down and wept in tears because they realized how backwards they had been how disobedient they had been, how defiant they had been to the Lord. When they measured themselves against the word of God, they cried. And he says, don't cry because the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. It's not material things that are going to make you strong. It's the joy of the Lord. It's not comparing yourself to other people that will make you strong. It's the joy of the Lord. It's not your idea of that, you, that you're better than somebody else that's going to make you strong. It's the joy of the Lord. It's not when you think you have found the perfect painting or the perfect pair of shoes. It's the joy of the Lord. You get this now. So how do I pray, Father, when sometimes things aren't going well for me? How do I have the joy of the Lord? Let me tell you, you can pray in that the, the, you can pray with joy always. Watch this. You can pray that God is loving when you don't even feel lovable. That ought to bring you joy. Come on, somebody. You don't feel joy because you're not lovable. God said, I, God says, I'm loving, so you ought to have joy. You can pray that God is sovereign when life is confusing. You don't have to understand everything because he does. You can pray, come on, that God is patient. Why do I, when do I pray this? I can have joy that God is patient, especially when I've messed up again. You can pray that God is wise, even when you don't know the path to take is good. How many times have I been lost and said, okay, Lord, I'm going to pause here and let you show me which way I should go. You can pray that the Lord with joy is all powerful when your situation needs intervention. See, there's many opportunities to have joy in the Lord through prayer. I can pray with joy that God is trustworthy when everybody else around me had not come through. I can pray with joy to the Lord. He's truthful. But I don't know what's right. Listen. Jesus prayed when in the face of temptation. And Jesus prayed in the time of trouble. And Jesus prayed when it was time to make a decision. Jesus prayed when he needed intercession. If you are on social or watch the news at all, you should be praying. Not, 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 not just a little quiet, oh, bless their heart prayer. But there's been so many, I, and this is going to come out wrong, but I, I guess it's too late. For, it's in my heart. I've prayed because I was angry these last few weeks. Amen, somebody. I, I said, Lord, what are, what are we doing? How do we aim a gun at a group of people because their skin is different than mine? How do we go to a neighborhood where I don't even live and decide these people don't have a right to life? How do you aim a gun at a 10-year-old? My heart has been, I'm sorry, saint to God, broken. And I've and I've been a walking prayer machine. I don't understand. I don't like it. Come on, somebody. I, I, I'm mad. 
But I said, God, you see, it's easy to pray for cars and houses. I wish I had a witness and healings. But I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to get any glory out of this. But you told me to pray that even in the tough situation that you get glory. And I'm going to be honest, I've been praying that he changed some hearts of people in high authority. Come on, somebody. I've been praying. The Bible says it's okay to pray for your leaders and those in authority. I've been naming names. Amen. Come on, somebody. This one, that one right here, Lord. Touch him. Come on, somebody. Say amen. See, prayer is not just for cereal. Amen, somebody. Prayer changes things. I'm praying a veil of protection over this nation. I'm praying that foolishness will be exposed. I wish I had, I'm praying that righteousness keeps its cool. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We need to bathe our day to day in prayer. I know we got celebrations and family and friends. Do this for me. When you, when you, when you come across people, you don't have to say, listen, let me pray for you. Just start praying for them. I wish I had a witness here. If you had, you got to go to the grocery store and you're standing next to somebody, just say, Lord, right now in the name of Christ. Come on, somebody. When you hear of, of, of trouble and tribulation, start praying, saints of God. Amen. Because Jesus himself prayed, if he had to pray, I know I got to pray. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise in his house today. Amen. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ, and we thank you so much for an opportunity to take a quick look at your prayer life. It was so much more to cover. We thank you, though, that we discovered that you prayed. You understood the season and the power of those intimate moments. We call it isolated intimacy. And we thank you for showing us that if the Lord himself had to pray, then it's certainly okay for us that we pray. So we thank you right now and ask that you continue to strengthen us in our prayer lives. It is in Christ's name we do pray, and for his sake we say, amen. Hey, you've just listened to such an impactful message. And I hope it was something said that touched your heart. And if you're not a believer, I invite you to give your life to Christ. Because there's a secret. I know that Christ loves you just the way you are. So I invite you right now to give your life to Christ. All you have to do is say the simple prayer. Repeat after me. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. We believe that your son died for our sins. And he is our savior. And Lord, we turn our lives over to you. This is in your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we celebrate you today because you've made the best decision of your life. And if you made that decision, head on over to atthecrossroad.org forward slash connect, where we can connect with you, we can love on you, and we can celebrate with you. And most importantly, we can do life with you. So if you made that decision today, we thank you, we honor you, and we look forward to what the kingdom has for you. Be blessed. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord through our giving. Here at Crossroads, we will lead the charge from the Apostle Paul that says God deserves our best offering. While this may look different for each individual, we believe in giving as God has prospered us and he loves a cheerful giver. Here are three simple ways you can give with Crossroads today. First, you can give online and visit www.atthecrossroad.org backslash give. Second, you can give by mail at our address of 304 Fairburn Industrial Boulevard, Fairburn, Georgia 30213. And lastly, you can always give in person during our weekly worship service every Sunday at 9 a.m. Or you can slide it under the door of our church anytime throughout the week. Whatever the amount God lays on your heart to give, we are beyond grateful for your continued support in partnering with what God is doing in and through us here at Crossroads.
Just a few reminders before you leave. Margie's House has several upcoming events and you are invited. This Friday, June 3rd from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., Margie's House will host a paint party. This empowerment workshop is open to all women. Food and child care will be provided, so make sure you register. Then on Saturday, join us for a virtual fitness class. The class will take place from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. This class occurs on the first Saturday of each month. Visit margeshouse.org to register for both of these events. Also, the Mobile Food Pantry will be providing fresh fruit and vegetables on Saturday, June 4th, and again on June 11th. Both times are from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. The pantry is open to the public, so if you know of anyone who could benefit from this resource, please share this information with them. All high school and college graduates, graduation Sunday is June 12th, and we want to celebrate your accomplishments. Visit our website to submit your graduation information. The deadline for submission is June 3rd. We will see you all next week for part three of the Praying Through series. Next week, Pastor Boone will give us real life answers for how to pray through the stuff we cause ourselves. I know this message will bless us all. So invite someone to come be blessed and fellowship with us. Have an amazing week. Thank you for tuning in to today's message. We pray you were encouraged and found real life answers for real life change. Before you leave, we'd love to hear from you about your worship experience and how you enjoyed today's message. You can reach our team through Messenger on our Facebook page, or you can simply shoot us an email at info at at the crossroad.org. Until next time, we want you to be strong, be safe, and stay blessed.